you're listening to the Saluki Games Cast. It's Monday, April 18th, 2022, and joining me as usual are Alicia Utech, Ryan Frills, and OJ Duncan. How's everyone doing this week? You know what? The sun is shining. It's gorgeous out. Life is good. Are you saying that because you believe it or you're trying to convince yourself? <laughs> I actually believe it today. I know there's been a few weeks here where I've been like, it's that point in the semester, but today, doing good. <laughs> I actually believe life is good. That That's positive. That makes me feel better to <laughs> hear someone say that. Um, how's your week been? Anybody had anything interesting this past week? Uh, so at uh, we had SalukiCon here at SIU and uh, the communication or the School of Communication Studies and Rainbow Cafe LGBTQ Center hosted the uh, Gamer Lounge. That's gay as in G A Y M E R. No, that is not being misspelled. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so uh, we had that. We had an awesome presentation by our very own Justin Young called "She Got Game." Um, we also had a puppet workshop that brought in a whole lot of people. So uh, it was it was pretty good overall. Yeah, the puppets were really cool. That was uh, that was uh, another graduate student here in the department, Diana, who was doing that, and uh, the kids seemed to really get into it. They were creating like uh, superhero puppets and things. There was one of them doing something with an HR worker. <laughs> it was Gary what? from HR, <laughs> but the HR in this case was humans as resources because Gary ate humans. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. That kid watched Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> that kid's parents are raising them up right. Yeah. I, think. <laughs> I, I have no problem. Hundred percent agree. Yes. <laughs> Ryan and Alicia, anything interesting this past week for you? Not really. No, I I wish I had been able to. I had other stuff going on on Saturday, but I'm glad to hear that Saluki Con went really well. Anybody have an exciting Easter at the very least? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, it wasn't bad. I just, I was lazy. Um, so, yeah, that, that was my Easter. I was lazy. I, I mean, I got grading done. That was, that was nice. It was That's fun good. times. <laughs> well, I, I just spent time with my boyfriend and with some of our friends, and it was really good. So let me tell you my complaint about Easter this year. So I go to CVS yesterday, yesterday's Easter, and I go to the CVS. It's like maybe around noon or so I run into CVS thinking it's Easter. They're going to start marking all their candy down. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the perfect time to go. It's like Valentine's day. Mm -hmm. So Valentine's day, you do have to wait till the day after, because there are always guys running into Valentine's, you know, running into stores like at nine o'clock trying to mm -hmm. find whatever <laughs> candy exists. <laughs> They're buying like a, a bag of mini Snickers bars and being like, no, look, this is a sign of love. <laughs> I definitely thought in advance about this. Um, just like Ryan thought in advance to silence his phone. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and so I go into CVS and I expect, okay, I'm going to get, you know, at, at the very least I'll get a bag of, um, of Reese's, the, the Reese's eggs, because those are the best Reese's cups. True. And yeah, see, like everybody agrees. You say that and everybody's like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they really are the best. Yeah. It's the perfect uh, ratio of chocolate to peanut butter. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I go in there and, there's nothing like there's one end cap that has a couple of Easter decorations, but there's no candy, mm. no Easter candy. So I guess they sewed out before Easter. Like mm. maybe they under ordered so they wouldn't have to discount and clear stuff out. But maybe. well, there's still shortages from COVID too. Like there's a pasta shortage at our local Walmart. I went to pick up some spaghetti and I couldn't find it. So maybe there's a bit of a candy shortage too. How can there be a pasta shortage? It's happened numerous times throughout the pandemic because uh, as we've been cooking, we made um, manicotti a few times, and there were months where you couldn't get manicotti shells. Just they didn't exist. I can get that more than I can get a spaghetti shortage. It mm -hmm. seems like spaghetti is like the most basic. It would be like if there was a saltine shortage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the news because, as I told you before we went on air, there is late-breaking news, so we'll get to that eventually. But let's start off with what we already have here, which is Shin Megami Tensei Five sold over 1 million copies on the Switch so far. Uh, that is the best-selling uh, Shin Megami Tensei game in history, is my understanding. 
this is the series that Persona is a spinoff from. Mm-hmm. So if you're not uh, familiar with the SMT games, Persona is a bit more kind of front and center uh, for mm-hmm. that franchise. Um, I don't know. Have any of you played any of these games before or have any interest in Part 5 on the Switch? I have not played any of them. I know my sister has started getting into the Persona games, so I will be interested to maybe check out like some playthroughs of this. I don't know if I would go out and buy it right now, but maybe once it's summer and I have some time to watch some playthroughs, I might change my mind. It, it's on a list of things I want to play. I, I really want to try it. It's just a matter of deciding what I, game I get next. Um, sure. I thought about this one, um, 13th Sentinels Angels. Aegis Rim, I think that's how it's pronounced. That just came out on the Switch, so I'm, I want to play that too. Yeah. Um, so the Persona games are solid games. I really enjoyed all of them that I played. Um, and I played Shin Megami Tensei 1, and I can't remember if it was a translation or if it was actually released on the PlayStation, or I think it was PlayStation. So I can't remember if I played it emulated in translation or if there was a regular translation done of it. Um, but it was a pretty good game. I haven't played any of the rest of them, but I am probably going to pick this up at some point. Part, uh, I was just saying, but like part of what also appeals to me is like I think I've heard it been described as like super hardcore Pokemon because mm-hmm. that's the thing I've I played uh, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu. I mean mm-hmm. Eevee, the v- Eevee version, yeah. not too long mm-hmm. ago, and I I enjoyed it, but I was wanting like a harder mm-hmm. game like yeah. afterwards. Um, and like this when I heard that this is kind of like Pokemon, but way harder, and you get to fuse monsters and stuff. I'm like, hmm. (laughs) Yeah, my husband and I played a, um, it was a free-to-play MMO Shin Megami Tensei game that was pretty good. Yeah, the the last one I played was Persona 4 Golden, uh, which I liked quite a bit, but it's also a huge time commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very much in that old-school style of, Japanese role playing games. Mm-hmm. So you are definitely committing for a 40 plus hour game mm-hmm. when you start one of those. Um, American Idol showing its cultural relevance Ooh. is getting into <laughs> the NFT business. This season, they are going to sell NFT trading cards uh, of the contestants. And so you're going to buy a pack of these which I, I, I believe I got r- right, which is $100 for a pack. And then if you end up with the card of one of the people who wins, um, they are going to send you a physical item, a physical ticket to Hollywood. Um, I don't think it's an actual plane ticket, but I, I guess a physical <laughs> <laughs> ticket to Hollywood if you happen to do this. Um you know, I feel like NFTs, the only value, the only way I've ever heard NFTs explained in any sort of way that made any sort of sense was they're like baseball cards. And so like selling trading cards, I guess, is a better use than most uses of NFTs. But this still seems really stupid. And I, I don't know who the market is for this anymore. Is anybody watching American Idol anymore? I have no idea. Yeah, I I saw this and I was just like, why? Like, who thought that this was the good idea? And like, I don't know. I never watched American Idol, but I watched, you know, other, I watched The Voice. I still watch America's Got Talent, all that. And I'm like, okay, so if you buy these cards, does it like count as votes towards the contestants? Or are you just throwing money at them? (laughs) I I don't think it's a vote because it's a random pack. It's just like buying a, a pack of Pokemon or baseball cards. Like you don't know which ones you're getting. Except it's crap. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have no, I don't like American Idol. I don't like this. Um, I, I get that it's been good for some celebrities careers, but I, I just don't like the humiliation aspect of it. It's I'm not. Yeah. I mean, it's a little different since Simon's not on there anymore. It's a little less, I guess, mean spirited, but mm-hmm. yeah, it, it seems like a show. This seems like, Everything NFT related is something that's past its prime that is trying to stay relevant by jumping on the bandwagon of the latest new technology. And, you know, the newest technology in this case is stupid. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about NFTs like laser discs. Like everyone's like, oh, this is the next big thing. Let's do something with it. And then it's just going to like peter out and be nothing. And only like 
some people with a lot of money are going to buy them, and maybe some schools will have them in a closet somewhere, but that's about it. Elon Musk is going to be, like, really into them. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> he is. Well, when he buys Twitter, that's going. everything's going to be NFT. <laughs> Every tweet is going to be an NFT. Oh, know, so. gosh. <laughs> I promise to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Alicia, again, you are contributing to this blight upon our society. <laughs> I just keep ruining everything, don't I? Yeah, that, that is your mo, right? Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog two has crossed a hundred million dollars domestically. It is actually at a hundred and twenty million dollars after it made thirty million dollars this past weekend, which was put it at number two, just only very slightly behind the new Harry Potter Fantastic Beast movie. Um, you know, I don't think there's another big movie opening until May after these two. So there's a chance Sonic the Hedgehog could be the number one movie in its third weekend because mm-hmm. that Harry Potter movie seems to be falling very, very fast. Mm-hmm. I was say I saw online the Harry Potter movie has had the worst opening weekend of any of the Harry Potter films. And honestly, Sonic should beat it out. Mm-hmm. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was a really fun movie. Did any of the rest of you see it this past week? I know some of you were talking about it. I haven't had time yet, but I'll be seeing it uh, within the next few weeks. Yeah, I've, this was a busy week for me, so I haven't um, watched it yet, but I want to. And also, good good on Sonic for beating anything that has J.K. Rowling's name attached to it. <laughs> Just That can be the next villain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, I mean, Jim Carrey has said that this might be his final role. He is looking at retiring Mm -hmm. and they've said they won't recast dr robotnik i think that i still think that they missed an opportunity to have his sidekick be snively from you know the old comics but if jim carrey does retire and they don't bring back dr robotnik it's gonna be and i forget his sidekick's name in the movie but he'll probably be the next villain i do not think jim carrey I cannot imagine a scenario where Jim Carrey does not come back to do Sonic the Hedgehog 3. This movie's made $120 million. That's just domestically. That's not internationally. Um, they are going to back up a dump truck of money to his door. <laughs> you know, they're going to pay him like Jim Carrey of the 90s when he was doing Ace Ventura 2. <laughs> they're going to pay him, you know, I don't even know what he's making for this movie. But, you know, it's going to be one of those... Hey, we'll pay you twenty million dollars to come back and do another Sonic movie, mm-hmm. because you know he is the most recognizable thing in that. You know, outside of the characters, but like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I feel like um, they will do everything they can to replicate this film in a part mm-hmm. three and replicate the success they're having. Um, Microsoft is working on an advertising platform for free to play games on the Xbox. Um, so a couple of details, that's not maybe that surprising, but a couple of details are interesting out of this. Uh, supposedly they would not take a cut of ad sales that use this platform. So if somebody buys an ad and it appears in your game, Microsoft would not get any of that, which is fairly surprising because... Uh, most ad platforms are getting some cut out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, the idea behind this is just to help get more ga- free-to-play games designed for the mm-hmm. Xbox mm-hmm. platform. Um, they also claim this will be non-disruptive, uh, meaning it's not going to be when you start the game, you get a thir- uh, you know 30-second f- or 15-second ad that plays. It would be something more incorporated into the game itself, so... One of the examples was like think billboards in a game, uh, which immediately made me think of Burnout Paradise, uh, one of my favorite games of all time, where the billboards were for electing Obama. (laughs) 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 We're up long after Obama had been elected and you're still driving around seeing billboards that said elect Obama. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, like, you know, for me personally, this seems like the least intrusive way to do advertising. I know in the NBA 2K, 2K games, they have advertising on the sidelines, um, you know, like where the um, where the commentators set and everything, just like in a real basketball game. And to me, you know, as long as those ads aren't distracting in some way, it feels very natural to have a Sprite ad there over on the sidelines or something. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I don't know. How, how do you all feel about advertising in games? So I think it's a great idea. Um, I remember that Anarchy Online, which I don't know if that's still running, um, but it was a futuristic MMO. And uh, they did adver- They went to free-to-play with advertisements within the game for a while, too. And I think that was the only way I was able to play it at that point. Um, so I think that a lot of more, a lot of free-to-play games, if their quality would be just great with this. I mean, um, the ads were like, again, like billboards or posters as you're walking past them. So um, I, I think as long as they're non-disruptive, it'd be great. I mean, I use a lot of ads in my free-to-play games and on my phone anyway. So, so this would be less disruptive than most of those. Yeah, I agree. I mean, nothing really to add there. Yeah, I think I was having a hard time picturing non-disruptive ads when I read this, but I think, like you said, it's like billboards in, in-game and posters in-game. You know, I think I I would miss some of the cleverness that I've seen go into those things in some games. Sure. But also, that's completely not obtrusive. So I, I would be fine with that. Yeah, something like this, probably would not work for, say, Grand Theft Auto Online because so much of the appeal of that game is the world that it's created, which mm-hmm. is, you know, often a, a parody of real-life brands and, you know, uh, ideas. And so, yeah, you see a game like that and you go, well, how do you integrate that into Grand Theft Auto? You probably can't. And so I, I think, you know, that's a situation where there's no really non-disruptive way to do that. Um, but some of these games that are much more set in the real world, it seems completely plausible to do. Uh, the Witcher 3, OJ, you have expressed interest in uh, going back and pl- starting this. Mm-hmm. The next-gen update, so for uh, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series S and X, um, has been delayed, and development for it has been moved in-house. So when this story first broke, there was a lot of, oh, this is a bad sign, something's terribly wrong. Since then, it's been made clear, at least to me, um, that the developers who are working on this were based in Russia. Mm, And um, basically that's been a a non-starter at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So they have decided to move development in-house to finish that up and everything and get that out. Um, you know, part of the question has been, is there a lot of clamor for this? Obviously, there are people still buying this game. This game recently had its biggest year ever, Mm -hmm. several years after being released due to the Netflix series. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's just going to be a little bit longer. They said not, they're not starting over from from scratch. It's just going to be a slight delay. So I kind of hope that they just, somehow introduced Henry Cavill into it and just have him shirtless. <laughs> like, if they're going to make us wait, then make it good. I think you need the PC version that's moddable. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that hasn't been done. It's going to I'm be... I'm sure. Or just <laughs> come out with a Henry Cavill edition. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just going to be that picture of him building his own PC. Have you yeah. seen that oh, picture? Yes, yes yeah. I absolutely have, yes. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have asked you that. <laughs> it's probably obvious. Um I, I just assume it's going to be that image throughout the entire game. Mm-hmm. Um, Fine with I would pay ninety dollars for that game. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give them ideas on how expensive they can make it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's DLC that will just sell like gangbusters. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know several people who would buy that game who have no interest in playing the game. They would just buy it and let it just run, I guess, on demo mm-hmm. or something, so they could watch him. Um, Hideo Kojima has clarified Kojima Productions, uh, the creators of Death Stranding. Of course, Hideo Kojima also responsible for the Metal Gear Solid series, or the Metal Gear series, I guess, in general, uh, will remain independent. This clarification came on Twitter, and basically because PlayStation had changed a banner on one of their websites that featured a lot of their first-party games, so Ratchet and Clank and Returnal and some of these other titles, and they updated it by adding Death Stranding to it, which a lot of people interpreted as, oh, PlayStation is buying Kojima Productions. Um, This comes as Kojima Productions is supposedly working with Microsoft to make a new unique game, um, and... Uh, as those rumors, as we've talked about in the past weeks, that 
there's a lot of rumors circulating that Sony and PlayStation are going to make a major purchase of some company. So you can see how this all kind of added up, but apparently it's a non-story. Um, there is not going to be a purchase of Kojima Productions this week, at least. Well, I'm good. And I really, really wish that they would, they were able to move forward with, uh, what is it, Silent Hills, because PT was amazing. I think this is the same company, right? This yeah. is the company. That, yeah. yeah. So uh, that was before he left Konami. Yeah. So, so I really wish that they were able to somehow get the rights to Silent Hills from Konami and, and create that game because PT was fantastic. And I still, I have my old PlayStation, uh, was it four? I think yeah, it was on PlayStation 4. Um, with the demo on there because you can't get it anymore, but it's fantastic. And I still go back and play it every once in a while just because it's, it's amazing. My old PlayStation 4. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's been one of the rumors is that somebody would purchase the IP from Konami. Mm -hmm. Like, that Konami doesn't seem interested in making console-level games anymore. They continue to make some mobile games, like some Yu-Gi-Oh!-type games. Mm -hmm. um, but that they have no don't seem to have any interest in making a new Castlevania, a new Metal Gear mm -hmm those sorts of games, and so that somebody might purchase the IP. And, of course, with Sony being rumored, that's mm -hmm. been one of the you know big rumors that Sony would come in, buy that, and then let Kojima make whatever of those games he wanted to make. Oh, I wish. He's been involved with all three of those series, like yeah. as a consultant mm -hmm. on one of the Castlevania games, the 3D uh, games. Uh, I forget what those are called. Well, they were kind of bad. <laughs> the first one's okay, but the second one, yeah, is, is pretty bad. That was Lament of Innocence, and yeah, it, I, I don't know. PS2 I era games? No, right? no, it's the oh, PlayStation uh, Three era, right? Well, there was an uh, I think it was the N64 or a GameCube 3D Castlevania that was pretty horrible. Yeah, well, there is one on the N64. Yeah. There is one on the PlayStation Two, and then there's a more modern one. Mm -hmm which is a complete reboot of the entire mm -hmm. franchise. It's the one that oh, Patrick yeah, Stewart... Oh, yeah, 2007 or whenever it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Patrick Ugh. Stewart does a voice for those. Um, and the first one's actually okay as a God of War ripoff. Um, mm -hmm. and then, <laughs> I mean, that's really what yeah. it is in style and everything. But mm -hmm. it, it's in a decent enough game. I remember enjoying it for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm putting this one in here because I feel like somebody in this room was a Club Penguin fan, and OJ immediately points at Alicia because Alicia <laughs> immediately starts looking sheepish. <laughs> um, Club Penguin is way too young for me. I, I, like, heard of it, but it was way too late for me to ever be involved when um, I would have been the creepy old guy on Club <laughs> Penguin that <laughs> I ever got into it. Um, but anyways, uh, some fans, apparently multiple different fan sites have, popped up over the years trying to recreate Club Penguin. One of the biggest ones was recently shut down by Disney. Alicia, tell us about your Club Penguin love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was never actually on Club Penguin as a kid, but it still makes me sad because I know a lot of my friends were, and I think I said this last week, you know, there's not a lot of spaces now where you can just go out on the internet and be a kid mm -hmm. and... Club Penguin was one of those really good spaces where you could do that. And so the fact that people made this fan site and obviously it was a labor of love. And then for Disney to just kind of come in and be like, you thought, psych, yeah. it just bums me out. <laughs> you know, I, I do kind of miss, like I said, I was never on Club Penguin, but every once in a while I, I like be like, oh, I remember Neopets and I remember Webkins and like all those kinds of things. All of those way too young for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry for reminding you of your age, Justin. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, you brought this up when we were talking about the potential Lego Metaverse project that Epic might be doing um, after the one billion dollar investment from Lego's parent company, um, and. You you noted that there aren't a lot of like kid focused spaces online. There's things like Fortnite, but Fortnite is really all ages, even if it's mostly kids playing it. Minecraft, very similar to that. Um, and one of the things that I think is, I, I think that's a good point, you know. And I've always wondered why Disney is not out there just making like 
here, here's the Disney World game. Seriously, mm-hmm. they totally could. And you can make your own character and wander around the park, and we're going to have exclusive merchandise you can only... I mean, they do this in mm-hmm. the park, right? They have a T-shirt you can only get this month at Disney World. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they have food that you can only get, you know, for Easter, the week leading up to Easter and stuff. Um, if you can't tell, I follow some theme park, like, bloggers <laughs> on Twitter and stuff, so I see all this stuff. Um and I just think, like, that seems like it would be really popular for young kids. And if you had, you know, each new Disney movie, you know, if you have Moana walking around and you have the characters from uh, Turning Red walking around, that would seem like a great promotion. And I just can't believe Disney or somebody can't figure out how to make that profitable for them. Well, and they even have examples. I mean, I'm thinking back now on, like, Cartoon Network used to have... You could go out on their website and play like Teen Titans mm-hmm. games and right. all of this. And I'm like, it's been done before. Mm-hmm. Why aren't you doing this? I would play it as an adult. And I think it's a good way for Disney to tap into people who can't normally go to Disney. Because I, I remember a meme saying this social mm-hmm. cases in the U.S. are never went to Disney, went to Disney once, or went to Disney every summer as they were growing <laughs> up. Right. <laughs> so you have that group of people who have like video game systems, but they're not the ones that are going to Disneyland ever. Right. Or maybe they went once. So that would be an easy way to tap into them and get more money. You know, we went to Disney as kids, not every summer by any stretch. It was like we went once when we were three and once when we were like 12. And like, <laughs> it's more like that. Um, but there was a game on the NES called, um, maybe it was just called Magic Kingdom, Disney Magic Kingdom mm-hmm. or something. Uh, I forget the exact name, but it was basically a park and you could wander around the park and certain rides you could get on and they were mini games when you got on the ride. And so... There was like a Pirates of the Caribbean and a Space Mountain and, you know, and even something as simple as that, it, I mean, obviously they're not doing it. They've tried things like Club Penguin have mm-hmm. been out there. So I just, from my perspective, I don't understand how they are not milking this more because mm-hmm. this just seems like a thing, you know, Disney putting out constant new properties. I mean, even tie it to Disney Plus, like, you know, if you subscribe to Disney Plus, you get a free membership to Mm -hmm. this online Mm -hmm. game. Um, That just seems logical, but maybe not. Um, Need for Speed is launching a new game this year, taking place in a fictional Chicago called Lakeshore City. None of you are from Chicago, are you? Um, I'm from the Northern Burbs. Oh, okay. So, so, are you excited to drive around a uh, a recreation of Chicago? I actually am. Uh, I was really excited playing Watch Dogs, drive, being able to drive around Chicago. I can't remember. Was that fictionalized or was it actually Chicago? I think it was actually Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah, so driving around there, and I'll be excited driving around a fictional Chicago, too, I think. This sounds like what Grand Theft Auto does with New York and mm-hmm. L.A. Like, we're going to get, you know, parodies of the biggest mm-hmm. highlights in the city and everything. So I assume there will be some version of the bean, but mm-hmm. what what will they do instead of a bean? Uh, a lagoon. A pea. <laughs> <laughs> Chick a pea. See, I think the, the the person who created the bean really hates it being called the bean, but yeah. he's also mm-hmm. a horrible person. So I hope <laughs> that they go along with some other type of legume rather than cloud gate, which is what it, it's technically called, but... You know, I hope they go with some legume just to piss off a mush Kapoor. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a bean, but color it brown so it's a baked bean. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Call it the baked bean. <laughs> <laughs> you could get uh, a Bush's baked beans, like, tie in there. There you go. <laughs> but that's Not disruptive to that. Yep. <laughs> Have that talking dog sitting by- beside <laughs> it. He's giving you missions and everything. <laughs> okay, you just made this game sound way way cooler. <laughs> I would buy that game. <laughs> See, I'm telling you. Um, no More Heroes 3 is coming to Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. Um, it was uh, originally a Switch exclusive, but it's getting ported over. Um, I played the original No More Heroes. It was, you know, fun at the time because it was a very stylish, um, kind of had its own personality type game. But I haven't played Part 3 yet. It supposedly ran fairly poorly on the Switch, so this theoretically would give us a a much better running version on the more powerful consoles and obviously PC. 
Uh, China is approving a wave of 45 new games. Their first new games that they've approved since July of 2021. So for those, you know, basically nine months. Uh, For those who don't know, in China, the Chinese government has to approve every game that gets released. Um, And so they have actually shut down for the last nine months. You could not release any new video games in China over the last nine months. Even with these 45 new game licenses that they're putting out, these will almost certainly go to local developers and not to international developers, not to, you know, Western or Japanese developers. Um, So, you know, that's a kind of a hard concept, I think, for us here Mm -hmm. to wrap our heads around where we get 45 new games a day, it seems like. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, and the idea that, the Chinese government trickles these out. That also seems like a, a thing that China is not going to be able to keep up long term. Like right mm-hmm. now, they're able to do that, but long term, you know, so many games are getting released. Like that just seems like a, a pain for the people who are even you know involved in it. Mm-hmm. Um, the so this there's an Activision Blizzard story every week. There <laughs> has to be an Activision yeah. Blizzard story. So here's this week's, and it's another bad one, since we had, a, I think, a good one last week. California Governor Gavin Newsom has been accused of interfering with the Activision Blizzard lawsuit. So if you remember, the state of California is suing Activision Blizzard because of their um, the way they treated employees and everything. Um, so he's been accused of interfering by firing the chief counsel on that case and in protest, the, um, let me get this right, the assistant chief counsel has resigned in protest. Um, you know, this, this Activision Blizzard story, it's just, I, I feel like you get one little nugget of happiness there occasionally, like something might go right for the people who work there, and then you get a story like this. Um, it speaks to potential political corruption. It speaks to the difference between the way the rich versus the poor are treated. Um, You know, if I am getting sued by the state, nobody's going to go in and fire the (laughs) chief counsel. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, It's just a really depressing story. Um, But I think it's an important one. You know, um, this is some people had asked why the federal government was also investigating Activision Blizzard. (laughs) This is why. Because the federal government can't rely on states to do the right thing necessarily. Not that you can rely on the federal government to always do the right thing, but it's why it's good to have multiple different uh, jurisdictions investigating an organization like this. Mm -hmm. This case has just gotten so weird. I'm really sad because I like Gavin Newsom because when Prop 8 passed in California, um, he started doing marriages against the law, which eventually led to the law being overturned and uh, same-gender marriages being um, allowed in the United States as a whole. So uh, he has a really great place in queer history, and I'm sad to see something like this happening. Well, this is an accusation. So, I mean, mm-hmm. we don't know, you know, um, that this is the case, but mm-hmm. it, it certainly looks and sounds bad. Yeah. Uh, Vicarious Visions, those who made the recent um, remake of the Crash Trilogy and then also the very, very beloved by people such as myself, Tony Hawk remake of the first two games, has officially been merged entirely with Blizzard. So Vicarious Visions no longer exist. They, those employees are just part of Blizzard now. So another negative Activision <laughs> Blizzard story. Say, I really hope they don't get dragged down by this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's that's a sad thing because you really hope that got announced shortly before, um, you know, that they were going to be merged in with Blizzard. Um, got announced shortly before, I believe, Microsoft announced they were buying Activision Blizzard and there was this hope that Microsoft might, be able to step in they obviously legally can't at the moment until that deal closes but at the time you know that maybe activision blizzard would put that on the back burner it appears they haven't um you know and i definitely wanted to see them tackle more of the tony hawk games because they did such an amazing job Mm -hmm. um if you haven't played that first one go go play it it's worth the time and money 
Captiv- Capcom plans to introduce a Capcom Arcade Stadium 2 uh, featuring 32 games. Um, Capcom Arcade Stadium 1 was a, a collection of different arcade games from over the years of Capcom's. Um, I, I believe when they originally released that, you could get Ghost and Goblins for free if you downloaded it, and then the rest were sold as DLC. Um, yeah, that. I don't know. That's exciting to me, uh, particularly if they do some of their later games as part of that. I don't know if there's any love for a particular Capcom uh, arcade game here. <laughs> um, but I was a big Capcom fan, so I'd, I'm excited to see what they do. Um, and then we had three late-breaking stories. About 20 minutes before we start recording, three stories I feel like broke in that time (laughs) period, or at least I was seeing them all at the same time. Uh, Netflix is launching a game uh, based on Exploding Kittens, the uh, card game uh, that you can buy, and an animated show starring Lucy Liu, uh, which is going to be about... (laughs) I don't know if this has anything to do with the game itself, but it's going to be about... God and Satan come to Earth and uh, inhabit the bodies of cats. What? <laughs> and that's the premise for this show. <laughs> it's going to be a very adult-oriented uh, animated show, which it sounds like from that premise. Yeah. Well, okay then. Oh, right. That's a choice. <laughs> well, I love Lucy Liu, and I love Exploding Kittens, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, I was going to ask, has anybody here played Exploding Kittens? So yes. You have played yes. it. So, I have not played it in a long time. Can you give us the 30-second explanation of what Exploding Kittens is as a board game? Okay, so it... Or a card I'm, game. I'm going to ruin this because it's been a couple of years. But so uh, it's a card game. You pass out the cards, and uh, the kittens have different, um, like, things that they can do. And one of the things they can do is explode. And that's about the extent that I remember right now. <laughs> I remember having fun when I played it. But it was before COVID, so it feels like it was 25 years ago. And you can use the cards to stop a kin from exploding, right? Yes. Isn't there? Yeah. Yes. You can, like, lay a counter card, almost like Uno to yeah. some degree. Yeah. Uno with, with kittens that explode. As a cat parent, <laughs> I'm offended by this content. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's representation. Cancel, <laughs> cancel your Netflix subscription. <laughs> I already have. <laughs> um. More exciting than that, or to me at least, is that the there has a Game Boy Advance emulator for the Switch has leaked out. Um, people have posted pictures of this, uh, both the back-end interface and also games actually running on it. This appears to be uh, the next step for the, um, the Nintendo Switch uh, collection of emulators. The thing that's unclear at this moment is, well, a few things. One, when this will come out, and two, will this be part of the base Nintendo Switch online subscription, which is $20 a year, or the expansion pass, which is an additional $30. That expansion pass currently includes N64 emulation and Sega Genesis emulation. There have been in the past rumors that they would release a Game Boy, just an original Game Boy slash Game Boy Color emulator, so I don't know if this means that will come as well or they're just going to leapfrog that and go straight to Game Boy Advance. Um, Alicia, before we went on air, you were saying that this might get you to subscribe to Nintendo Switch Online. This is how they're going to get my money. <laughs> you know, I I grew up playing Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance. Nintendo DS was when I kind of started falling out just for money purposes. But I tell you what, if I get the chance to play you know, Ruby and Sapphire version and the old, even, even as hard as they were to do on the Game Boy Advance, old Spyro games that were on that, and that that will be how they get my money. Yeah, so which game would you, which game would get you to subscribe? Which game of the Game Boy Advance catalog could they put on here that would get you, any of you to subscribe to this? I don't need a specific game. I kind of missed out on the Game Boy Advance era. Um, so I haven't played very many games from it at all, but I'm very excited to see they're available and I can just flip through the catalog and, and play them. So that just just being Game Boy Advance has won it for me. 
All right, did Game Boy Advance have the, the game Golden Sun where you had to go out in the... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that game specifically. If they could... Because the emulations, I could never get to work correctly for that, but it seemed like a fun game. Well, it has Golden Sun, but Golden Sun is not the game that had the sensor on it oh, that okay. you had to go out into the sun. Okay. Uh, that's a different game, which I'm blanking on its name right now. That's actually a Kojima game. Okay. Well, um, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's weird and bizarre. Um, yeah. So whatever game the sensor was then, but also Golden Sun, because I know that I want to play that for some reason. And OJ, <laughs> this is all, I mean, this is how Mother 3 might come out, so yeah. that was... Yeah. Was it Game Boy Advance? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. In Japan only. Yes. Then again. Yeah, that would seem an obvious one. Yeah. Like to finally bring that over and everything if they're doing this, because that would definitely get a lot of people to subscribe. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, it would be the Metroid games on there, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Metroid Fusion and Zero Mission. Mm-hmm. I would be excited to play through those. I doubt this would include the Castlevania games. They've already sewed a separate package with those. Mm-hmm. Um, but it sure be cool if they did though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would. I mean, you never know. I mean, they sewed a separate package with Mario 64 and then included it as part of the N64 emulation. Mm-hmm. So you never know. Um, last story. And this one I'm going to say, take with a big grain of salt. Uh, but heat vision blog was reporting this. They've been fairly reliable in the past that Warner Brothers is readying a Minecraft film, something they've been working on for a while, but apparently this is as far as having a director attach and casting, and the, the casting is what's fantastic. Jason Momoa, Aquaman himself, is going to star in the Minecraft film. It's going to be from the director of Napoleon Dynamite. So um, how excited are you for a Minecraft film with Jason Momoa? So here's my thing. It, it makes sense to have Jason Momoa, and I never thought about this until I heard that Jason Momoa was in there. But with all the mining that you do, you're going to be really muscular, right? So it makes sense to put Jason Momoa in there if he's going to be doing a lot of mining. And even though there's not really a big storyline for Minecraft, there's a lot of big events that happen that you could build a story around. So someone gets whisked away into Minecraft land, and then they have to go to the nether and then go to the end and defeat a dragon. Or you could just make multiple. You could have a the first one where he's just building a castle, right? He goes through this world, starts mining, and builds a castle. And then eventually he has to go down to the underworld, and then that could be part two. And then he has to go to the end for part three and defeat this dragon. So there's, there's a lot of room in there to have a good story. Um, and I don't think anyone's going to complain seeing Jason Momoa doing any type of physical exertion like mining or building. Listening in the sun while he pickaxes mm-hmm. a mountain and gets cubes out of it to build a house. <laughs> right. Him and Henry Cavill are going to <laughs> be maybe uh, nemesis in the film. Exactly. Or they can work together. Uh, they can work together and get in a hot tub together. And I think that everyone <laughs> would pay money. to. Get, this would be the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 movie as a video game movie. Uh, if they, I would did concede that, that defeat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did the the biggest movie ever for uh, women and g- gay men. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like this would just be a blockbuster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no one thought it would be Minecraft, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and there's plenty of straight men who have said that either uh, Jason Momoa or Henry Cavill would be like their one exception. So you're getting everybody here. Like <laughs> you're you're not going to lose money. Everyone's going to go see this. Like it's going to be a national holiday. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you would have to still stay very PG because this would be a kids franchise, right? It doesn't have to be. I was yeah. saying, you <laughs> know, how many changes. kids franchises are go go crazy with. Right. Look at Ren and Stimpy. Look at Rocco's Modern Life. Like, you can have, like, themes in there that. Right. Oh, Rocco. For, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I feel like a mind. If you're making a Minecraft film, they've got to be thinking in terms of like a cinematic universe, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think a trilogy is is thinking too small because mm-hmm. you can literally create entirely different worlds mm-hmm. within this. Yeah. So you could have Jason Momoa pulled into this world, and you know, then another film completely detached from it have somebody else, you know, brought into it. Just not yeah. Chris Pratt. <laughs> uh, Chris Pratt as Garfield. <laughs> well, in in Minecraft too, there's a there's a server where they're trying to recreate the Earth, like, and New York City is like really really well done already. So, I mean, you can do anything with it. Um, did did you say though that the 
director of Napoleon Dynamite is directing it. <laughs> yes. That's the one thing that, like, because, and look, I I grew up with Napoleon Dynamite as a kid. I watched that movie. I, I listened to the commentary a lot. I, I swear the commentary is even funnier than the damn movie. <laughs> but I I saw some of his later movies, and I, I, uh, I don't know. Mm. That's the one thing I'm a little pessimistic about. But, I mean, I'll, I, it's still Minecraft, and it's still got Jason Momoa, so hopefully. Yeah, I was trying to think, what else has he done? Done, um, the director. He worked on Last Man on Earth, the uh, the series, mm. and uh, Nacho Libre. Mm-hmm. He did Gentleman Broncos. I hate that movie. <laughs> Don't sugarcoat it, Ryan. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I it, there's nothing good to say about that movie. It was awful. Mm. It it looks like he's mostly been working in television since. Nacho Libre. Oh, he did Masterminds. I remember Masterminds bombing pretty hard. There was a Napoleon Dynamite animated show. I'm not sure how much he was behind that, but and it was it was bad too. Well, he can go back to his roots and give Jason Momoa and Henry Cavill like an iconic dance. There we go. <laughs> like Jameer okay, Kwai would, would sign, be good. sign on, and I'm one sure of them an ironic T-shirt and yeah. everything, mm-hmm. and the other one in no shirt. Mm-hmm. Or both with no shirt. <laughs> Just tattoo and ironic t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, all right. So that's news for the week. Uh, let's talk about what you've been playing. Alicia, what have you been playing? So I finally beat Pokemon Sword. I beat the main game. I beat the post game. And I will say I was a little, like, the main game ending was fine. I would have liked to fight Chairman Rose a couple more times. Because you just have one big fight with him. And I'm like, you know, at least give me, like, in the Gen 1 games when you fought Giovanni, like, four times. <laughs> give me a little bit more. Um, but I did actually really enjoy the post game. So in the post game, these two weirdos show up. I'm Swordward and Shieldbert. Google image, their haircuts. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's a disaster. <laughs> but... They are randomly Dynamaxing Pokemon, trying to get Zacian and Zamazenta to go crazy. And so I actually, and the cool thing with that was you got to run around with your rival and with one of the gym leaders Mm -hmm. going around and stopping the different Dynamax Pokemon. So I thought that was a lot of fun. I think Mm -hmm. in line with what I've seen, like a lot of people praised Sword and Shield for having really great character designs, and I think that post-game also got to play with a little more character depth in both your rival, in the new professor, and in Piers, who is the gym leader who's running around with you. So I actually really enjoyed it. I still have to tackle the DLC content, but... Have you played much of it online or at all? No, I have not yet gotten into the online portion because that know. costs money <laughs> oh well yeah i guess it does on the, that's what we were just talking about you haven't subscribed to nintendo switch online yet okay um anything else uh, a little bit more legends rcs i didn't get a chance to play any kirby this week which was a bummer but i think probably this next couple of weeks are going to be a little light on gaming for me just with wrapping up the semester but i'm hoping like first First week of summer, I would love to just binge and finish Kirby because I'm already really struggling to dodge spoilers. <laughs> um, Ryan, how about you? So, uh, I played through the third chapter of uh, the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Uh, it actually is probably overall my least favorite chapter. Not like the game's going downhill or anything. Just I thought that, I think the storyline to me was personally a little less interesting. But you can tell they're also setting something bigger up. Um, what I did like about it, though, really was that I do I do like the fact that they are starting to kind of merge the different forms. Because I said, like, the first game was, like, more about working in the courtroom, uh, sorting through the evidence, stuff like that. The second game was more, detect- like, point-and-click detective work. This is probably more the courtroom, but you're starting to introduce some of the, like, but the way you interact with the evidence feels a little more like the detective work because there's actually, like, a piece of evidence. It's, like, a small setting in and of itself that you have to interact with. Um, and I like that in this game, uh, like not to give too much away or anything, but just it's about him 
defending some being a defendant for somebody who he doesn't fully trust or believe in. And I think that's like an interesting angle to take for storytelling. Um, Cause you know, that's going to be, you know, he's got, you know, his heart in the right place and good ambitions. He wants to defend people that are, you know, wrongfully accused, but you know, this is going to be an issue that he's not always going to necessarily trust everybody. He's going to end up defending. So I think that was an interesting uh, way, direction to take the story. Um, I won't say much more than that because I don't want to get spoilery, but I, it was story Seems like a very Perry Mason way to take the story, like classic Perry Mason, not the new detective game or f uh, TV series, but the old classic Perry Mason show of, you know, here's the conflict for Perry Mason as, you know, defending somebody he doesn't like, he doesn't trust, you know. Um, that sounds interesting as a way to go. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to Chapter 4, and then I guess... This is the um, combination of both games, so there's going to be 10 chapters overall, so I'm looking forward to just continuing. And um, The other thing I played was uh, OJ, was it called TKO? Yes. I can, And I can leave you to talk about that one if you want. Um, yep. oh, okay. Uh, it's, so that's like one of the Jackbox games, and... Uh, it's it's kind of set up like a shonen battle anime for anybody that doesn't know what that is. It's like that's the animes where you see like dudes fighting, um, like Dragon Ball Z or Naruto or something. But it has like Hello Kitty esque Agratsuko esque characters, like those cute minimalistic chibi animal designs. And you're just trying. You're in like this deathly competition to make the best T-shirt. So. Mm -hmm. One of the things you have to do is you have to come up with a drawing, then you have to come up with a slogan and just try to do. I think you all have to like come up with the same amount of drawings at the time, but like slogans, you're trying to enter as many as possible, and then you're going to get randomly get chances to combine some of those, and then you're just trying to then combine other people's work to get the best T-shirts, and you will win based on getting like the best T-shirt made, but the people that also get their design selected for that will get credit, and um, just some truly meme-worthy content <laughs> was in that game. Like OJ made a T-shirt that like should just be a new meme. That's, what, that's all I'm going to say on that. But I'll let him talk about it if he wants. But yeah, really, really fun. Um, just light little party game. I love that TKO Jackbox games. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things about TKO is at the end of it, you can actually order the T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Like they give you a web address, you can go there and actually order the T-shirts you just made, which. Uh, this past summer, some friends and I went on a trip together and we played that game and we were extremely tempted to buy it, one of the t-shirts. Like several of us were like, should we buy this? Like, and then we thought, we'll never wear this in public. So maybe <laughs> this is not one to buy, actually. Well, I do have the website up for one of the t-shirts and I'm still debating. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what was this meme-worthy t-shirt? I need to know now. Right, is it something so you feel comfortable sharing? Uh, we, have, we have mostly an adult audience, right? Sure. sure. Okay. So uh, I, I don't know how just, adult this goes. <laughs> um, there's an adult word. Uh, and so it's a, a, a picture of a, a smiley face guy with yellow eyes and, and blue um, eyelids with just a, a straight mouth. Um, and he has uh, a stick figure body, but he kind of has biceps. And then underneath it, it says, does he look like a bitch? Uh, so that was the quote from uh, Pulp Fiction. There's another one with someone who kind of, it's a stick figure Bigfoot is the best way. Like, so the, you know, the Bigfoot picture where he's like looking at the camera, mm -hmm. that's kind of what it looks like. And underneath it, it's like, no, not Tim Allen. And <laughs> I was happy about that because that's both my picture, my drawing, and both one of my, the ca my catchphrases I came up with for t-shirt. So. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. So, yeah, I have the website up for, for those. Uh, there's another one, which is a purple dragon that said death to heteronormativity, which I think I might also buy. So That was so cool. Yep. I uh, love this. <laughs> I, I want to play this game now. <laughs> and then here, so everyone can see the picture of... of it. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. The um, TKO, which Jackbox party pack is that part of? Um, I believe it's four. Okay. Um, but I'm not 100% on that. All right. Uh, but look up TKO. If you've, <laughs> if you've played the Jackbox games but never played TKO, then it, it's really a fantastic party game. It takes a little longer than some of the other ones, mm -hmm. but it, it pays off. It's worth it in the end. Oh, and it's, yeah. it's T as in T-E-E -E as in T-shirt, K-O. Yeah. This might be my favorite one mm -hmm. of their games so far, actually. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely on my short list. It's like top five, you know, mm -hmm. of my favorites. Um, anything else, Ryan? 
Um, no, those are those are the two games I've played this week. <laughs> All right, uh, OJ. Um, so I I played Kirby. I I made it through to the ending, so I will I will stay away from spoilers. So Alicia uh, doesn't have any spoilers. Um, I'm a little upset at some of the things that we had to do because I always want to get 100%. Um, and so in the like the main storyline missions, I have 100% of those. But then there's all these little like side missions that generally deal with one of Kirby's powers and you have to mm-hmm. go through and do a certain thing. And on some of them, I just cannot meet the time requirement. And I'm really hoping that there's not a 100% timer that I have to get those uh, all for. And I haven't looked up to see if there is one yet, but I really hope there isn't because some of them are hard. And some of the, some of the um, like, level, th- like, things, because there's five different things each level that you have to do to get to save all of the Waddle Dees. Um, and some of them were just rough, but but I got I got all of them, so... It's like um, Mario 64 in that way, yes. like collecting stars. Mm-hmm. Like there's different goals in each level. Yes. And uh, luckily it tells you what the ones are that you miss. Because, I mean, I was looking at a walkthrough anyway just to to see and to try and get them. And I, I never looked for the first run, but for the second run I wanted to get them all because I hate running a level like over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's one especially, and it was like the second, oops, the second to last level, um, and there's one where you had to get to the very end of the level, and it was a long process to get there and not fall in the lava. And then I fell in the lava over and over and over and over again. And one time I almost made it, but I sit far enough back from my uh, Switch that uh, if I have my controller, like, behind my leg, if I have my leg up, it'll, like, block the signal. And it did that on the time, and then so I just kind of... I, I had to sit back for a day and just be like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm way too frustrated at this one. But I finally got them all, so uh, I really like the game. There is some after-game content, um, which I'm working on now. Uh, but I'll leave that um, I'll leave that for later so I don't spoil anything. And let's see. Um, also, we played TKO. We also, at the uh, Gamer Lounge, we played What the Dub, which I first played in your class, Justin. Um, and since then, I've played it multiple times. I think it's a really great game. That's a game I really want to try because I'm a movie nerd and I mm-hmm. like mystery science theater. And mm-hmm. wait, so fill me in. What is what the dub? So and what the dub? It's uh, it's like a Jackbox game, but it's a different company. And it shows an old scene from an old movie. They're, I, they've all been black and white. I think they all are. Um, and it ha- it shows a line, and then it shows the next part where someone's saying something, but there's no no audio and everyone has to go through and put in what that next line is. And then it goes through and plays them all. Uh, and it can be very hilarious, especially if a group of, if you have a group of like-minded people. Yeah, it does like text to speech. Uh, so it actually has the lines being read, whatever you wrote. <laughs> so it, it puts them into the scene, like the characters are saying. So God, that's I amazing. Wanna, I want, I want to try this one. It's fantastic. Yeah, it was really popular um, at SalukiCon when we were playing that and everything. Um, you know, that seems like one of those games, once people see it, they, they really get it, mm-hmm. you know, and like it. And you and I were talking about that Rift Tracks, which is some of the people who did um, the original Mystery Science Theater, they have actually teamed up with that company to make a sequel that's going to be Rift Tracks themed. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know exactly how that's going to work, like how what elements of Rift Tracks are going to come into it, mm-hmm. but uh, apparently they're going to, um, it's going to be Rift Tracks. The, that could either be one. really <laughs> fun or get really boring really fast. Because mm-hmm. like what I'm picturing in my head now is like if pe- people come up with lines and then, you know, the thing plays the line and then they just have like a generic Rift Tracks mm-hmm joke on it or riff on it right so like if it's just that that could get boring really fast but also the guys who do riff tracks are some of the most creative people on the face of the earth i think they're up there with weird al yankovic Mm -hmm. and so i think they could make it really fun it it would be cool if they did like a game mode with like where you're making like where you have like some of those educational shorts and you're filling in lines (laughs) for those because Mm -hmm. some of the funniest i mean I haven't watched, like, that many full episodes of Mystery Science Theater, but, like, some of the funniest stuff they did, I thought, was, like, when they were just making fun of, like, those educational shorts. Right. That was, those were great. And they still do that with Rift Tracks. A lot of those are actually mm-hmm. you know, available for free uh, on streaming on their website and everything. But, yeah, those are fantastic. 
Um, so that's what the dub and TKO. Uh, TKO is part of the Jackbox Party Pack mm-hmm. Four, we believe, but <laughs> I always have trouble keeping straight which one is in which. Mm-hmm. Um, but what the dub is completely separate. I think it's about ten dollars. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it, it's pretty cheap. Yeah, um, and I, I think it's worthwhile. I've, mm-hmm. I've definitely gotten ten dollars worth of enjoyment out of that game. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so anything else, OJ? Um, I, I started to watch the Halo series, but I've, I'm watching it as I'm laying down for bed and I've fallen asleep. Not because it's boring, uh, but because I've been very tired. So uh, I'm planning to, to watch the Halo series at some point while I'm awake and able to to really process it. So it failed to wake you up. Well, that's all I need to know, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, when OJ says it, not because it's boring, I would argue, yes, because it's boring. <laughs> um yeah, so I, I I caught up on the latest episode of that. Um, those episodes come out on Fridays, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, that first episode has a lot of promise, and man, it just goes downhill from mm-hmm. there to a show that, it, you know, I think I said before on this podcast, I don't think Halo has a good story to begin with. I think it's just super generic sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Um but this takes that and tries to expand it into adding character depth to these characters, but you just don't really care. Mm-hmm. Like they're they're showing me like Master Chief as a little boy, and I'm like, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't care. And there's a, a whole big thing about his dog when he was a kid, and you're like, I, I, like who cares about Master Chief's dog? <laughs> um, and you know, like. I'm I'm fine with expanding the cast. Like I, I get that. Like you can't do a, an entire series where it's just about him, right? Mm-hmm. Like even the Mandalorian doesn't do that. They have to expand the cast and add in some additional people for him to interact with. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, it's just this is, and so far it's not even any of the. You know, I I think the thing that's most interesting about Halo is like them discovering the artifacts and discovering kind of the lore and everything, and this has the tiniest bit of that, but it's like 1% of the show four episodes in. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, well, this is just like random space drama so far. (laughs) Okay, show pitch, knowing nothing about Halo. It's about Master Chief as a kid with his dog, Banjo. Master Chief is just like, looks like Opie, but just with the Master Chief helmet on. And he lives in a town like Mayberry from the Andy <laughs> Griffith show. And then aliens start to attack. And he's like, what are we going to do about this, Paul? And he's like, well, I'll tell you, Master Chief. Or I don't, I don't know. It's that kind of sh- It'll be that kind of setting, though. And it'll just be Opie, though, if he had Master Chief's helmet and a dog named Banjo. <laughs> and aliens are attacking Mayberry. That's the show. Also, I, I heard that we get to see adult Master Chief's butt. Yes. Yes, <laughs> you do. Um, you get to see his butt. You get to see... Um, I think one of the female characters, but so not, the, not that that's a reason to watch the show. <laughs> right. Trust me. It's like, it's not paid off in any way. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it, it just feels so generic watching it. And maybe this goes somewhere interesting by the end. Um, one of the other sparring characters, there's a sparring that's a woman this last, the fourth episode, there's kind of an interesting scene with her, but I, I don't feel like I like the actress very much, mm. and I don't like how she's playing it, but I feel like I kind of know where they're trying to go with it, and I think that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, Master Chief's just a boring character, <laughs> yeah. and um, it's really sad and disappointing. Um, so that was on my list to talk about, so that's why I followed up <laughs> immediately <laughs> on OJ with that. The other thing I've been playing this week, and I think I mentioned this the week before I had started, which is Tunic. Uh, Tunic is the game where you're sort of a three-quarter overview, uh, and you play a little fox, and you are running around. And now I'm far enough to start seeing some of the surprises in the game. So I'm going to talk about those in as vague ways as I possibly can (laughs) so as not to spoil it because I think this is a game you want to know as little about as possible. So I'll tell you that you discover your abilities in this game by collecting pieces of an instruction manual, and it looks like an 8-bit instruction manual. Think the original Super Mario Brothers. 
um, and you're collecting pages of it. So, for example, you don't know you can do certain maneuvers until you collect that page of the instruction manual. And then you're reading it going, oh, if I hit this button, it'll do this. And if I press this at this particular location, it'll do this, which makes you rethink the levels that you've been through so far, the areas, I guess I should say not levels, but the areas that you've been through so far, and you go, okay, well, I, I need to now go back there because there's something new I can do. And it's almost um, like a Metroidvania game in that regard, except you're not actually gaining new abilities. You're just learning you already have these abilities that you didn't know about. Um, the game itself is a lot of, a lot of hidden passages. So the game really wants you to look literally in every nook and cranny uh, behind every object. So like there will be uh, a rock and you'll think, okay, well, there's just a rock there. But no, there is a passage behind that <laughs> rock. You need to go behind it and walk into that rock to access mm-hmm. this secret passage. And so it's a lot like um, the original Dark Souls in that the levels kind of, start winding in onto themselves and everything. And you, after you've been through enough, of it, you start to discover, okay, well, where this ends, um, it drops me back out into the main area. And I could have just went straight to the end of that, that section right from the beginning, but I didn't know that entrance was back there hidden. Um, and, it's a constant sense of like you're discovering something within the game. Like you constantly feel like you're finding something, you're discovering something. Um, You know, I could see it potentially getting frustrating. There are some parts that I I think, you know, knowing where to go, what to do next can get frustrating, but I just constantly feel like I'm learning something new in the game. And what I learn puts other parts of the game into a new context. Um, and that's been really fascinating because I, I don't feel like a lot of games do that anymore. And the closest thing I can compare it to, you know, originally when I talked about it, I said it looks like a Zelda game. It kind of feels like a Zelda game. It reminds me of playing, you know, A Link to the Past or Ocarina of Time where you're discovering something. You're going, oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, and, oh, I went through this entire level and, oh, I'm ending up back here where I began, but like in a in a different way. Um, it just feels so much like that. And that sort of like endorphin hit that you get, uh, when you're playing a game like that, where you feel like, Oh, I'm discovering something. I'm doing something cool. I feel smart playing this game. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, not if you get into a frustrating bit, I I understand, but like when you do discover that next thing, you actually feel kind of smart for a moment. And that's a, a, a feeling that I don't feel like a lot of games give me anymore. Mm -hmm. And Tunic does that exceptionally well. Um, And I think it's like, I'm I'm not done with it. I I don't think I'm really very close to the end, but I'm at a point where I'm thinking this is, this is going to be high on my end of the year game list because uh, I'm just having so much fun and enjoying the experience. Um, that does it for me. Um, I did play what the dub, we already talked about that, (laughs) but I had played that previously. Um, I do highly recommend what the dub and TKO. So, um, let's get to our big question for this week. And our question this week is what is the funniest video game you have ever played? And, um, OJ, I don't think we usually start with you. So why don't we start with OJ? So I was thinking about a lot of games. There's a lot of funny games, but uh, one of the first funny games is because I have a I, I very much enjoy fart humor. I'm not gonna lie. Like <laughs> you, you can just show somebody farting, and I will probably laugh at it. So I remember on N64, I think it was Conker's Bad Fur Day, <laughs> uh, which was just a lot of potty humor uh, throughout it, uh, and I thought it was I thought it was hilarious. It was the first type of game like that that I ever played, and I thought it was uh, I laughed a lot at it. So uh, I'm gonna put Conker's Bed for day. It might not be the funniest that I ever played, but it was the first one that made a lasting impression on me. I'm going to guess you're a big fan of the Poop Boss. I absolutely am. So there's a uh, was it? a dung beetle, I think, that keeps rolling a big like a big pile of poop and then you have to like 
just go up and you're you're going up this big gigantic pile of poop and it's it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was especially because that was being published on a Nintendo game yeah. or system at that time. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of very surprising. Yep. Um Ryan, how about you? What's your funniest game you've ever played? Um, I think funniest overall game is actually like, and granted, it's also it's not like continuously funny. It's also got serious and sad moments too. But it is probably actually what I'm playing right now, The Greatest Attorney Chronicles, just because some of like the exaggerated facial expressions, like when you have somebody in court, are like hilarious. Like, I think in the one in the chapter I just played, like there's like a, ba- a rich banker dude who starts like chewing on his cane and then like his <laughs> mouth is just like it just gets really cartoonishly <laughs> animated while doing it. Um, and then there's, like, in Chapter 2, there's a character that's introduced called Herlock Sholmes, <laughs> who is, like, a really bad Sherlock Holmes, um, but although also really cool-looking and steampunkish. Mm-hmm. But, like, he, and he's not always, like, completely wrong. Like, if somebody makes a point, like, he's uh, his guesses get to the heart of the matter, but he also just makes some really wild off-the-wall, like, deductions, as he calls them, <laughs> and... Uh, but I think the funniest moment I've ever had in a video game is, um, so there was the Spider-Man 2 game for, like, Spider-Man mm. 2 movie with Tobey Maguire and directed by Sam Raimi. And, and uh, Mysterio is a villain in that game. And at first, like, he's a big deal villain. Like, he's a special effects guy that wants to show, hey, I can beat Spider-Man. And then he actually does have, like, I can't quite remember it, but there's some big plot he has against New York where he's, like, a serious enemy. But then, like, the final time you show down against him, you're like, somebody's like, help, somebody's robbing the convenience store. And you're going in there and it's Mysterio. And just Mysterio's brought down to robbing a convenience store. Like from super villain to robbing a convenience store. And at first you're actually scared because like you see like his health bar come up. It's bigger than anybody else's health bar. It gets charged like multiple times over. And you're like, oh no. And then I just walk over and punch him once. And then it cuts to cut scene and it's him like <laughs> flying past like the checkout debt. <laughs> Checkout counter, and then he gets arrested afterwards, and it's just hilarious. <laughs> um, that's the funniest moment in the game, funniest game overall, greatest attorney Car- chronicles, uh, funniest moment, Spider Man 2. Yeah, we definitely need Thanos like shoplifting a bag of Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> That would, that would work. I mean, I, I'd love to see a, a superhero game where it's all the super villains like doing the most like minor crimes. <laughs> like, you have to stop. Um, you have to stop uh, Venom from jaywalking or something. <laughs> well, we know from Batman the Animated Series that Joker doesn't mess with the IRS, so <laughs> you could get Joker for tax evasion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Alicia, you earned so much respect from me for quoting uh, Batman the Animated Series. <laughs> Just what a great show that is. <laughs> One of the best shows ever to exist. <laughs> um, Alicia, how about you? What's uh, the funniest game you've ever played? So this question unlocked childhood memories that I did not remember existed. (laughs) Um, I just mentioned Batman, the animated series. Um, Continuing with that, the DC animated universe in the early 2000s, they released a Teen Titans PS2 game, and it starts off very similar to one of the episodes of Teen Titans, where in that episode they their spirits get transferred into puppets and the puppet king is controlling them well in this at the start they wake up in a video game (laughs) video game gets mailed to titan's tower they're like cool power it on and then wake up the next day and they're in the video game so the whole time they're trying to figure out why they're in this video game what's going on and you know you come across slade and robin thinks he's running it and it's like nope he's (laughs) part of it too and then you come across the i think it's the master ceremonies is the villain And nope, he's not running it. And at the end, it's all the players' (laughs) faults. So I I really enjoyed that kind of fourth wall shattering Mm, humor. So that I had completely forgotten that that game existed until I saw this question. I was trying to think of funny video games. (laughs) Yeah, I've never played that, but that sounds really clever. Like making it uh, the you know a villain would trap them into a video game. Like really, you know, bringing that into the plot and everything. That sounds clever. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I have two answers to this. Um, one, as far as like the actual game, the writing and everything for me, it's Sam and Max hit the road. 
Um, Sam and Max Hit the Road is a, a Lucas Arts adventure game, point and click adventure game. Um, it's based off of a comic book, which I've never read, but it's about a dog and a rabbit who um, have a detective agency. And it's just one of the absolute funniest games, and it's all voice acted, and the voice acting is superb in it. It's one of those games I feel like really needs uh, a modern remake and everything, but you can still play it today, and it still holds up. Um, it's an adventure game, so it's frustrating, but they lean into that like purposefully at times for humor, um, and it's just a game I absolutely love. Um, and makes me laugh even thinking about particular scenes and everything in it. Um, and then the other one I was thinking like to play um, is the Worms series. Oh, mm. good choice. Mm. And my friends and I used to play that back in college. Um, and it was just, you know, 90% of the time, whatever you're trying to do is going to backfire on you. <laughs> so like you're trying to lob a grenade and you throw it and it ricochets and bounces back and lands right <laughs> at your feet and <laughs> blows up your worm. Um, and that game just more like accidental humor than any other game. And of course, there are these little tiny worms and when something blows up, they'll go, oh, no. And, you know, which just makes it all the more enjoyable watching them suffer. And it's the sort of game, even when you lose, you're happy losing because it's been in a ridiculous manner. Um, and so I just think that game produces more laughs other than maybe something like the Jackbox or What the Dub. Uh, probably more than any other game I can remember playing, just laughing at it. So I was just thinking about that. Yeah, those are probably the games that actually make me laugh the most <laughs> is when we play those. Yeah. But. Yeah, um, I think some honorable mentions too because you mentioned Lucas Arts is the Monkey Island games. Yeah, definitely, uh, and also just for the point of absurdity, funny is the Earthbound games uh, because Earthbound was just was hilarious in how absurd it is. And something I always remember is how the moles were fighting over who was the third most powerful mole, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and all all five of them said that they were the third most powerful, as if that were a station of honor, and that's something that's always stuck with me. Yeah, what a beautiful commentary on how we fight for mediocre <laughs> titles. <laughs> and while we're at throwing out honorable mentions, I'll actually Mario Party Three. I played when I was a kid. I played the campaign mode. That was actually kind of a funny campaign mode because of like the interactions with the characters. Like, um, like Bowser kept trying to like you were trying to get the Millennium Star, is what it was called. Like, prove that you're like the superstar of the game or whatever. And so people would compete over like who's the most courageous, who's the most beautiful, who's the strongest. Um, and I think when it was like, who's the most crafty or something, it was like Waluigi and then Bowser tries to get in on it and like compete with Mar Donkey Kong and Waluigi. And then Waluigi beats up Bowser. <laughs> um, like it's a cloud of smoke, you know, cartoonishly. And then he just kicks back on all of a sudden you see like Waluigi's foot sticking out and kicking out Bowser out of it. And <laughs> at one point he tries to jump in on when Daisy's trying to challenge you for beauty. And then Daisy just gets scared and smacks him. And he goes like off in the distance in the stars, <laughs> team, team rocket style. And, I think the, the funniest might have been that when, because I was playing as Donkey Kong because I liked Donkey Kong, but like when he had to be challenged for strength, which is what Donkey Kong was good at, who was going to be the character that challenged him? And whoever uh, was getting challenged on whatever they were clearly the best at, it was Luigi, which is kind of sad. <laughs> oh, it's kind of sad to see Luigi come and like, I'm stronger than Donkey Kong. <laughs> and so it, it's, it was a strangely funny campaign mode. I'll, I'll give that a shout out. Well, yeah. Luigi's legs might be stronger than Donkey Kong because, like, that jumping in Super Mario Brothers too, where he's like jumping higher than everyone else and True, fluttering but his legs. Donkey Kong like punched down the moon in one of the games he was in. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're gonna get technical about it, <laughs> um, yeah, that that reminds me. The Paper Mario games can often be quite humorous. Um, I think a lot of role playing games can mm -hmm. be very funny if if the writing is good, if the localization, you know, usually from Japan to the U.S. is pretty good. Those can be very funny games mm -hmm. sometimes. So mm -hmm. I don't know some of the Final Fantasy games have made me laugh at mm -hmm. times. I'll say, I don't know if I would count Final Fantasy VII as funniest video game I've ever played, but there's definitely some scenes in it <laughs> and in Remake that were really well translated to the modern day, I think, that are absolutely hilarious. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in the original game, there's a scene, there's a part where... Cloud has to go around collecting clothing items to cross dress to get into the Honeybee Inn. The Honeybee Inn and to deal with Don Corneo 
being a major ball, let's call him. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then in the remake, they did it where not only do you have to cross-dress, but you have to perform a whole dance number as mm -hmm. well. And that was hilarious and amazing. Mm -hmm. And I love it so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think they handle that well, particularly in the remake of, uh, of not, you know, not making fun of cross-dressing. No, so it's much. not making fun mm -hmm. of it it's at all. It's making fun of his situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah. It's making fun of the fact that Cloud has to cross dress. Right. It's not making fun of cross dressing at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. A, a good collection of funny games, I think, <laughs> there. So, that does it for us for this week. Thank you for tuning in. If you have comments, questions, ideas, please send those. Justin.young at siu.edu. We'll pass those along. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you then. Bye.